Um, I gave a talk about a year ago in the stages seminar series, and there is some of this that overlaps, so if you, uh, if you fall asleep during that first part, I won't blame you. I'll assume that's what it is. Um, uh, I also, my, I talk quite quickly, and I have a lot of slides as my style, and my goal is to talk more quickly than Michael Hoffman can tweet, so <laughs> it's got to keep the pace up, but that means I would very much encourage if you have questions to like tackle me, throw a hand up, uh, stop me along the way. Me too. Uh, yeah, feel free to tackle Michael if he's tweeting too fast. Um, so the, I, the other thing I have to do right up front is acknowledge, so Shannon Ellis is a postdoc of mine who's about to go take a faculty position, and um, I stole most of her job talk for this uh, presentation here today, so anything awesome in this is probably due to her, and anything that's a mistake is probably due to me. So, all right. Um, so I'm going to start off with like a pretty basic question that we would ask maybe a lot of the time, and, and especially if you're interested in cancer. What makes a primary cancer uh, sample different than a met metastatic cancer sample? And so uh, this is a motivational question because I kind of have to take a step back and think about what it takes to ha try to address this question in a scientific way. Um, and so the first thing that you would have to do if you were somebody like me who's a statistician and you wanted to answer a question like this is find somebody who has access, access to patient samples. I discussed this today with the students that that can sometimes be a challenge because there's sort of political issues involved and so forth. Then after you do that, um, you have to collect the patient samples and collect information from those patients about uh, the tissues that you've collected, including metadata. Um, then you have to extract the DNA and RNA from the samples, sequence the samples. These are sometimes optimistic numbers on how long it might take to do this. This is like your dream experiment happening all along. This is a statistician's conception of how long it takes to do molecular biology. Um, and then uh, you have to process the data. See, this is, takes a long time, because I know about this part. So this takes a long time to process it, clean it up, analyze the data, and answer the biological question that you actually cared about at the beginning. So this is like how long it takes to do a scientific study to answer a question, right? And so that could be two plus years, uh, half a PhD if you're a grad student. So uh, you know, maybe a third of a PhD, depending on where, where, where your program is. And so the question is, are there ways that we can speed this up? And I think Peter just gave an amazing talk about ways that you can do that. And Jen has been working on this for a long time, as many people here have. Is how can we speed up this process if you want to answer scientific questions? How can you speed that up by leveraging the fact that we've already done lots of scientific experiments? Um, so it, this is increasingly true that biologists are great at uh, making their data available to the public in forms like SRA um, and, and other sort of uh, formats, SRA Express, as well as a number of other um, public access uh, websites. Um, so you can kind of, if you find a data set that answers the question that you care about, you can kind of skip this part of the process. You sort of have like reduced it down. Your PhD just got a year shorter, so that's nice. Um, but there's still this whole part of the process that might take you a while to do, and it would be a challenge to do. So my group has been kind of focused on imagine you could find these data sets. How could you simplify this part of the process? <laughs> So one of the things that's a little frustrating, if anybody, if you, you know, Peter just alluded to this, that nobody, hopefully nobody will ever have to do this again. This is a sentiment anybody who's worked with public data will uh, resonate with, that hopefully you only have to organize that data once, and you don't ever have to do that process again. And so similarly to the efforts that they've been doing here, we've been making efforts primarily focused on transcription and RNA-seq to try to synthesize and collect data and make it accessible. So I'm going to talk briefly about this. First part, the group processing and sequencing the data and the data cleaning, and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, the rest of it here. So I'm going to skip this part because I assume we all know what the central dogma is and that some RNAs get made out of DNA. This is the cartoon guide to uh, the central dogma. And then there's some proteins. We measure the RNA. Um, and so the variability in the RNA is what really allows us to answer a lot of these different questions uh, about that we might be interested in molecular biology. Um, and so, what the way the tool that we use right now, I, I'm reliably informed by my colleagues, Mike Schatz, and other people that these tools might eventually become obsolete. But at the moment, we do short read sequencing of RNA. Um, and so, you basically extract the DNA, chop it up, sequence the sample, and obtain short read data from the sequencer. It's just that easy. There's no other complications involved in that process. <laughs> Again, you've got a statistician talking to you here. Um, so, you get these short reads that look like this. So you get a file out that's 40 million lines long, or however many lines long is the number of reads that you have, maybe, divided by the number that you need to describe one read. And then you're going to use this to try to answer questions. Now, I have heard, had a collaborator come in one time who tried to do this in Excel. That is not the recommended way to analyze a file like this. So you have to do some stuff before it's actually useful. 
Um, don't tweet that last bit. Like, all right, so you have to take this information about which sequence it came from, what's the actual sequence, and some of the quality scores, and do things like map it back to the genome, and quantify it, and so forth. This is a, uh, a rather tedious process, but is a process that's now been studied extraordinarily well by lots of different labs all over the world, and so there are already good protocols in place for doing this part of it. And most of the pain is knowing what protocol to pick, having the computers to run the protocol, taking the time to run that protocol, and having it not break in one of the thousands of weird ways that it can, like that, that pipeline can break. So we can kind of think about reducing some of this pain by we'll do that processing ourselves. So what do we do with these 40 million reads? You can take, again, cartoon guide, you've got a reference genome. You can align the reads back to the genome, and so there's a number of different ways to do this. We use a tool, of course, we have an aligning, a collaborative computer scientist, an alignment, read, short read alignment is like a fun problem for computer scientists, they love it so much. So they've done it many different times, and one of my colleagues, Ben Langmead, is one of the people that's very good at this, they produced a new aligner which allowed us to align many, many samples at the same time. That's the main innovation of this aligner, but it does many of the same things that other short read aligners do. So we align the reads back to the genome, um, accounting for the fact that there are these junctions. Then we um, compute a, a statistically compressed version of this RNA-seq data. We just basically count the number of reads that covers each base. So this gives us a, a coverage vector that's three billion numbers long mostly zeros of how many reads cover each base in the genome for that sample. And then we also calculate the number of times each junction is covered by a read. So we have those two pieces of information, a junction table and a, basically a vector of counts for each base. So this is a significantly compressed version of the, uh, the raw reads that we have. But from this very compressed version, you can recompute transcript abundances, gene counts, exon counts, um, and many other things. You can reassemble, you can actually do assembly using this compressed version of them that his colleagues have shown in the computer science department. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah just Please do, yeah. do that. When aligning, I know we use the quality information. Yeah. Are there any tools when quantifying the number of reads that align that try to estimate the confidence? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that we have in house that we haven't. Uh, pr published yet, but one of the things that you would want to do, for example, is look and see if there's any um, variance in any of the reads. So you might want to look and see if, there, if it aligns with, with, a, with a one base change, say, for example, that would be a variant. Um, so what we've actually done is, for all of these samples we've actually computed, in addition to the, just the baseline coverage, we actually have one coverage track per alternative allele, A, C, T, and G, and it shows the number of reads that cover each base when that's an alternative allele. So using that, you can actually genotype the samples as well, but that poses a difficult re-identification problem that we're sort of dealing with, which is why it hasn't been published yet. So, and with um, the spicing junction, can you do isoform expression as well? Yeah, you can estimate isoform expression as well. We just put a preprint out just like a couple of weeks ago where we did, we, for all the 70,000 samples we did this for, we also produced transcript components too. Uh, they're, they're, they're good, but they're not as good as you would get if you use something like Callisto on the raw reads will definitely be better than ours, but you get pretty good estimates using the compressed version. Um, so then you might want to ask some questions. What percent of the genome is expressed? What, are there any new genes out there? Are they important expression outliers? What are the best methods to use? And some others are the question I asked at the beginning. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're kind of synthesizing this resource that basically calculates those gene expression abundances. And it has two components to it. So there's the component where we process the genomic data that I just showed you a little bit in cartoons. And then the part I'm going to spend most of the time today on, so that's work that I talked about a lot last time I was here, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how we deal with the metadata, the labeling of the samples, which is also complicated. It's not the easy thing to deal with. So just briefly to touch on the sequencing data and the process and quantify, we took all the samples from the GTEx project, which is 500 and some odd individuals, 1,000, 10,000 total samples. We took all the samples from TCGA, which is around 10,000 samples as well, across multiple cancers and multiple sites, as well as normals. We also took uh, 50,000 samples from the Sequence Read Archive, and we processed all of them together using that alignment pipeline. And so we have them all consistently processed using the same pipeline, and then quantified using that pipeline. Um, we're now working on release two of this, which will have an additional, I think, 60 or 70,000 additional samples that have come out since the last time we processed this. So this is a 
you know, sequencing data is being generated very rapidly, so this is going to be a quickly expanding resource. So these are the actual exact numbers for the sample sizes for all of these things. Um, so you can get this. This is on, um, if you Google recount2, or you um, look at, there's a website up here, jhbiostatistics.shinyapps.io slash recount, and I'll put the URL at the end if you don't want to scroll that down quickly. You can go download all these data and access them directly and load them into Bioconductor. There's also a recount Bioconductor package for you to access them if you want. Uh, so we have this ex estimate of expression for every one of these 70,000 samples, and we can calculate what do we mean by expression in a number of different ways. So this is a, a cartoon, again, of a transcript here, of the different transcripts at a particular locus. So this is a single locus with one, two, three, four, five um, exons. In this case, um, we're going to imagine that this exon is not annotated, in the, it like, doesn't exist in our current annotation for that gene. There's different ways you can quantify them. You can quantify, you can just calculate the number of reads that goes into any of the annotated exons. That's the gene level measure. You can calculate each exon individually. You can calculate um, the transcripts. Uh, as I just mentioned, there's a method that you can take the sequencing uh, junction counts and the base resolution coverage and estimate transcript counts. And then you have the junction counts directly. The last thing that we often do in our group is just met, since we have a measure at every single base, you can just find those bases where there's higher expression than background, whether that's annotated as a region that's protein coding or not and then call those expressed regions. And I'll show you an example of what one of those looks like in a minute. Um, but that, we use that because then you can find things that were not necessarily annotated in the, in the annotation when you were um, quantifying. So we produce all of these estimates for every one of the 77, for the 70,000 samples in the recount seed project. But I'm gonna focus on expressed regions because that's what we're using for this prediction problem I'm gonna tell you about. Um, so we have, 70,000, say, samples, we have, uh, depends on how you count, but you know, 20 or 30,000 measurements per sample, um, and we have those for genes, exons, junctions, and expressed regions, okay? And this is like the first two months of uh, recount data. This is the number of new users. It's not going, it's got like, there are a relatively modest number of users of the software in the first couple of months. Um, there's 550 people, but it's interesting because they've accessed 417,000 files. So what that means is each individual person is downloading big chunks of the data, and in fact, two of the first users just downloaded the whole thing. It was like the first thing that they did when they logged onto the site. So we're seeing uptake, and in particular for people that want to consider these large um, problems. And the reason why that's useful is at first, when we released it, they weren't annotated hardly at all. We like basically had the study name on the, each sample, but that's it. So basically the only thing you could do is do these like global analyses that didn't really take into account the phenotype information. Um, so we're here in our problem, suppose we could find some publicly available RNA sequencing data from primary cancer and metastasis. <coughs> we could start at, with the process data that we have in recount to try to start answering this question. So then we could skip this pre-processing step if we do the data from recount too, because this is the part where we had to align all the reasons. Okay, so we're moving down this pipeline a little bit. So here's the tricky part, and this is where I want to spend the bulk of the time. So we have all these different measurements, and we want to answer some questions about human biology and expression, but the problem is that for the most part, we don't have the phenotype information for almost every sample that we've collected. The GTEx samples and the TCGA samples are relatively well annotated. Everything else is like the total Wild West that we have no idea. I'm going to show you some examples of that. So we're going to use these expressed regions plus this phenotype to try to get at what this phenotype information is. So the expressed regions, just to show you an example of what one of those looks like. So this is a, a, an example from, uh, these are the actually brain samples from the Lieber Institute in Baltimore. And so what we've done is we've taken a, a collection of 16 samples. And this is just a region um, along chromosome 5, 161 megabases on chromosome 5. And we show this is the average coverage across those 16 samples. So you can see it like pops up here, and pops up there, and it pops up there. So then we just draw a line across. And we say if you're above the line, any contiguous region above the line is an express region. And that's how we define express region. Mostly this just finds exons, like coding, coding, coding exons. But it also finds sometimes regions in places that are in currently in intergenic, what's labeled as intergenic DNA or in, in tronic DNA. Um, and so uh, we do this 
cut off because we originally did a hidden Markov model and all sorts of fancy stats because, you know, statistician. And then it turns out if you just draw a line across, it works fine. So we, <laughs> so we uh, basically invalidated a previous paper that we wrote about hidden Markov models and replaced it with a line. So it works fine. <laughs> Oh, great. Oh, great. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about this in silico phenotyping. So we're going to try to take, so I think, hopefully, I'm going to pause here because I did that fast. Does everybody kind of get the genomic data that we've collected now in the process? Any questions? Yeah. Are there differences in the type of the protocol that you use for the RNA So if it's a PolyA library versus a library yeah, there are definitely differences. And in fact, they go, the data sets go all the way back to kind of the beginning of RNA-seq data that were deposited. So they have single end, paired end, uh, different bredo depletion versus poly A pull down. There's like every possible variation on those things. Some of those things are annotated, some of those aren't. We're predicting some of them. I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and so you can, now with the phenotypes we've added to this, you can subset to whichever protocol that you would like. Um, yeah. You just take raw counts. Do you do any data normalization across platforms? And the counts that you the counts that you have that you download from the database are unnormalized, but we have functions in the R package that allow you to normalize them according to how we suggest. But there's also other tools that there's a DEC version of the normalization that you can do instead, and we have a protocol for that on the bioconductor like a yet on the bioconductor website for doing that too. So it's un unnormalized to start. But can't if you do a basic clustering of those, unsupervised clustering of those 70,000 samples, what's the main discriminator? Blood. Is. No blood. joke. It's like blood is like the number, the number one. Like blood many of them are blood samples. samples. Many, many of them are blood samples. And I think blood and, and study are the two. Like you can see the studies clustered within, but there's this big chunk of blood samples. Yeah. So this is the. Phenotype, if you just download the phenotype information directly from SRA, this is the phenotype information that you get. Um, for the most part, most things aren't annotated, um, any of the variables you would care about when you're doing your analysis. Um, so this is an example. This is a relatively good study. They actually labeled everything, and the names are like reasonably consistent and everything like that. In general, it's not like that. So this is, for example, how sex is labeled across SRA. F, 95 times, female, lowercase, 2,000 times. You would know this name very well here, I'm sure, but male, lowercase, male, uppercase. Um, so that gives you 3,640 samples. Um, but these are other examples of ways that it's been labeled, um, some of which make total sense, pooled male and female, but like unknown, what does that mean? Make sure, we're not really sure what that means. Male, note, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> And so the total is there's only like three or four thousand total samples that even have a label at all. But this is a variable that's pretty common and you would probably like to know it when you're doing your analysis. And so fortunately, since we have the genomic data, this is a relatively straightforward one to get from the data, right? So there are 4,700 4, that have an assigned sex at all, 44,957 that don't. So what we're trying to do is predict phenotype information for all the samples in RECAP2. And the thing that we're going to do, we're going to use to, to make that prediction is we're going to basically use the fact that we have two relatively well annotated data sets to build and test our predictors. Then we're going to apply it in the SRA. Okay? So here, these two data sets are nice because they're really large sample size and they're really well annotated. The folks that are on that get a lot of grief for being on these big consortia, but one thing they do really nicely is they spend a lot of time thinking about how they're going to organize metadata and it shows. So first what we do is we build a training set in GTEx. We build and optimize a phenotype predictor. Um, so one of the things that's nice is in GTEx, there's very, very little missing annotation for a number of variables, sex, tissue, race, age, a relatively large number of technical variables as well. So you have a, a significant number of variables that you have very complete information on, which is nice when you build a predictor. Uh, so for example, the, there's no missing data on sex, for example, in the, in the GTEx sample. Although there's one that's a little bit tricky, trickily labeled, that, you have to, that we figured out when we were building the predictors. But, um, and they have some information about that in their main paper. So they build, we build our predictor here. We test the accuracy within data set on a validation set within the GTEx samples. Um, then we predict across studies so that uh, there's a number of different groups that are doing this really nice work showing, for example, Giovanni Carmigiani's group and my former student, Prasad Brazil, who are showing that 
if you really want to be able to measure the accuracy of a genomic predictor, you need to measure how well it does outside of the study that you built it in. Even if you're outside of the training set, you need to be outside of study to really get a good measure. And then once we do that, we're going to predict the process array and try to do our comparisons there. So I'm going to kind of briefly go across the, the, the methods that we're using to do this. They're really quite simple, really quite naive. And last time I kind of talked a little bit about this. I know this is like the center of AI and deep learning of the entire world here in Toronto, so I feel a little embarrassed saying we just use linear regression models. But we do, we just use linear regression models. There's probably work to be done in just making this, these methods fancier and getting better at the prediction that we're doing. So the first thing that we do is we identify those expressed regions that so differential expression between the phenotype that we care about, in this case male versus female. Um, so we find a set of discriminatory regions. And then once we do that, we basically fit a model that, by, we find those by fitting a model that relates the phenotype to the expression of each region, and then ranks them and finds the top 100 most differentially expressed, say, regions. Then we extract those regions and get their coefficient estimates across uh, the original study that we're working on. So this is basically finding the relationship between expression and phenotype. So here we build another model that relates the phenotype to the expression of each of the uh, regions so that we get a set of coefficients. Um, so then we can calculate a likelihood of, of each level of the phenotype for each individual. And we do that by basically using those coefficients <coughs> that we estimated previously and calculating the expected uh, phenotype conditional on the covariates that we, uh, conditional on the expressed regions that we have. This is all like straight linear models. We do a region by region selection, then put all those regions in one linear model and do a prediction. So then we get estimates for each of the uh, discriminatory regions, and then we can basically predict that phenotype in the training set, test set, and validation set. And we do that by basically finding the value of the phenotype that maximizes the likelihood in the, under the linear model. And so we assign a phenotype to each category, so this one's pretty easy. We pick the likelihood is much higher for male than female, so we assign the different phenotypes, and that's how we like, basically build our predictor. This is like the simplest thing you could possibly do when staring at your data set. Yeah. So how did you deal with the, the batch and bags in the data set? Yeah, so we did not, so we, we were doing prediction here, so we didn't adjust for the batch effects at all, because we wanted our, our selected regions to have to be robust to the batch effects. So what happens is in the training set and the validation set within GTEx, those are across multiple batches. So the predictor is having to like estimate, it has to predict well across batches within the study. And then I'll show you in a minute how well that, that translates to out of sample batch effects. But in the case of we're dealing with, we've not adjusted for batch effects since we're doing, we want to predict out of study, or we want the batch effects to be a problem for our predictor at this stage. So GTEx is relatively key, I mean, really key compared to SRA. Yeah, so, so you're going to see. I'm you'll sure see. it works you're, because you're smiling, but I guess <laughs> sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah. you estimate it will be so dirty that it's. Yeah, so that's, a, yeah, so I'm going to keep going through this, but I'm going to tell you that we're going to talk about where it works and where it doesn't. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and I'll, I'll tell you about both. I like to be honest about both the good and the bad. So um, then we get those same regions on the new data set, apply those coefficient estimates, and build our predictors of the new samples using our regression model. And so we get predictions on the new data set, and we can evaluate its accuracy. So um, basically, we do the first three components of this on the training set. We basically train our model there. And so we get some accuracy measure on the training set. Then we apply it to the validation set, we get some accuracy measure there. Then we apply it to TCGA, we get an accuracy measure there. And then we apply it to SRA and get an accuracy measure there. And of course it's 100%, you know, this isn't actually the numbers. This is just like telling you the gra what the graphs are gonna look like in a minute. They're not gonna be this good. Um, so let's do, let's do the real thing. So this is sex, actual sex prediction in the GTEx data and Interestingly enough, we don't get 100% accuracy in predicting sex in GTEx. And in fact, in GTEx, there's multiple samples that come from the same individual. And all of our errors in both the training and the test set come from a single individual. So it's multiple tissues, all assigned to the wrong sex, from the same individual. So we, if you go read the GTEx papers, there's a reason that, that, that we're actually doing the right thing here. This is like not, it, we actually are 100% accurate depending on how you define biological sex. So um, then 
we applied it to the TCGA test set and we got 99% accuracy, which is pretty good. We felt pretty confident about that. Again, there's some weirdness here, but the weirdness is we get repeated samples. We often get the repeated samples we're getting or missing, so we're still feeling pretty good. We go to SRA and we only get 86% accuracy, which is a bit of a drop, but two things to keep in mind. One is we, have, we only have 3,000 samples, the ones that were actually labeled in SRA to compare to. And the other thing is we don't know for sure that the labels in SRA are right. So what we could do is go examine this a little more carefully. So there are, are there any studies that are decreasing our accuracy about across SRA? So this is the frequency with which, so it's the accuracy for that study, the proportion correct is the x-axis. So for most studies, we're 100% correct. And then there was one, there's a few studies over here where we're 0% correct. We don't get any of the sex right. And then there's a variation in between, okay? So not only that, but there's one study where we get 0% correct that has 200 samples in it. So that's a significant hit to our accuracy in the, in the SRA data. Right? By 0% correct, you mean you predict the exact opposite? Right, so for this, yeah, we're predicting the wrong sex every single time. That's so why do you think, that's yeah, pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so why do you think that would, can you guess why that would happen? There's well, a, they, they, they flip the labels, right? They flip the labels, right? So we think, we suspect, we haven't quite, we track, haven't tracked it down with the authors yet, but we think that in that study they flipped the labels and we got 100% right, but 0%. So, to see this, we can look at Y chromosome expression. So this is the report for the reported female samples, the reported male samples, you see more expression on the Y chromosome, as you would expect. For our predicted male and predicted female samples, for the most part, you see the distributions you would expect as well. But then you can go look at some uh, specific studies and see some weirdness going on. So for example, this is the distribution predicted male in green, but reported, uh, female, or sorry, reported male, they, a lot of the reported male samples are at this blue distribution, they all have really low Y chromosome expression. So these are reported male, these are reported female, but we predict them to be male, but they have really high Y chromosome expression. So this is like probably a sample mislabeling. And you can see, so that's that first one over here on the left, then you see other weird things like this, where it's like, here's this one on the right, where you have, this is our predicted female samples, these are our predicted male samples over here, then the reported female and male samples are all, have low, very low uh, expression on the Y chromosome. So we think that this is, again, probably a mislabeling of only one of the two. We think the male, the females are right and the males are wrong, yeah. Uh, what's the balance of the classes? In these studies? Yeah. Uh, in this study, this is the one. This is the one where we had it all wrong. You can kind of see the balance of the studies by the. Um, well, no, you can't. I'm asking this. like the balance of male and female. Oh yeah, I'm going to show you that in just a second. Okay. Actually, yeah. Are you sure there are cell lines? There are there are tissue samples. These are these are tissues. The one I'm, I'm, I'm sure picked you tissue samples, but there are some that are cell lines. Yeah, for sure. And there's. We have lower accuracy in the cell lines than we do with the them to bring their Y chromosome. So. Yeah. So yeah. So Y chromosome genes in, in what you're using to predict here? We're using Y average Y chromosome or sorry, summed Y chromosome expression is what you're seeing. Log summed Y chromosome. Oh no, expression. no, I mean in the in, as an input you know, to the Oh in the in, in the phenol predict we're using we're using a selected set of regions, some come from Y, some come from X. So our prediction is using an unbiased selected set of expressed regions to predict. I'm just using Y expression as a valid like as a measure to detect whether we think our prediction is right or not. So then we went and looked and we saw that so this is there about of the seventy thousand samples in recount, there are more samples predicted to be female than male. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, so GTEx is a little bit male biased, TCGA is a little bit female biased, um, and this has already been reported. Um, so then looking at SRA, it seems like there's a few more female samples than there are male samples, and there's a large number that we don't assign. So I didn't talk about this too much, but if we don't have enough confidence, if the likelihood is are too similar, we don't assign a sex to the sample, we just say it's unassigned. So there's 3,700 that are unassigned. Um, and it's interesting because a good fraction of the studies are, so these are, the purple here is female only studies. In other words, they're studies where it's only female samples. And the green is male only studies. It's only uh, males in this, in this sample. So it's interesting that a significant fraction of the studies on SRA 
are only one sex or the other. So it's kind of an interesting. Uh, so that's kind of gives you some idea of the balance. Uh, and then there's these vary a lot. These are the mixed data sets, and they vary a lot from you know just a fraction one to half fifty fifty. Is it harder to predict cancer, sets of cancer samples versus normal samples? Let me yes, and let me show you an example of that here in a minute. So. This is um, our, we did the same thing, but we did a tissue prediction. So this is tissue prediction in GTEx, tissue prediction in um, validation of GTEx, tissue prediction in TCGA. Now this is what we were more impressed by because now we're not just predicting one of two classes, we're predicting one of like 30 different classes. So having a 76% accuracy is significantly better than you would do if you just guessed. We only get 51% in the SRA um, and so both of these numbers are a little bit discouraging because they're not that great. Um, one thing that we did note though is if you, so this speaks to your point a little bit then, so this is the healthy tissue in TCGA, we have a 92% accuracy on the tissue prediction, whereas on the cancer samples we have a significantly lower prediction. You see a similar result if you do sex, you get higher prediction if you do um, non-cancer and cancer. How did you divide to validation and training? This was divided randomly Random. once at the once? beginning. Yeah, so this is, this is what I would consider to be, uh, so we only build within the training set, we do cross-validation within the training set, okay. then we report, this number is reporting only our final predictor, only applied once to the validation set. So that's a relatively good within study, out of sample measure of accuracy, but not a very good generalized error measure, which is why we're doing this exercise here. Yeah. Do you think if you train in on cancer samples and try to predict that healthy tissue would be an easier problem? Yeah, so the next, I'm not showing this here, but the next set of problems we're working on is predicting cancer status and predicting various different other phenotypes beyond these simple basic phenotypes. And so what we're doing right now actually is predicting cancer or no, then building separate models for all the other phenotypes if you're predicting cancer versus if you're predicting well. Have you divided TCG cancer to primary metastasis? We haven't in this analysis, but we could do that yeah, pretty easily. Helpful. And those, all of these phenotypes that I'm showing you, every number I have here is all based on phenotype data that's now publicly available via recount. So if you want to like do any sub-analysis, it's all, you can just download it and look at it. So how many tissues are you considering here? How many tissues? This is all of the TCGA data that is in cell. Okay, so it's defined by the this is, this is TCGA data, sorry. This is TCGA data, pink. Purple is GTEx and this teal is SRA. And the reason why SRA is low is we only have um, 8,000 samples you'll see here that are labeled. And those 8,000 samples that are, or sorry, 9,000 samples that are labeled. And those similarly to sex are labeled in all sorts of ludicrous ways. So what we did was we actually took, there's another uh, group that made a computational prediction of the tissue using the natural language processing on the abstracts of the papers. And so they have, it's called shark. So there's a shark prediction of phenotype and our prediction of phenotype. And this 51.9% accuracy is measuring against, we're treating shark as a gold standard. So this is saying, if shark is 100% right, we're 51% right. But we've already kind of started validating that there's cases where we do better than that. So um, we think, we think this is probably like an underestimate, but it's a conservative estimate for how well we're doing on SRA. Yeah. Is this just a multinomial logistic progression that's making the predictions for the Here it's not it's not even that fancy. It's just a linear regression one per tissue. Okay. Yeah, it's not even we don't even, we fit a different linear regression model for each tissue. That this is actually goes back to the Hausman model that he uses for, so Andres Hausman proposed this model for DNA methylation data for predicting what cell type fraction comes from that each one. You can do that by fitting a series of linear regression models and then picking the one that has the best likelihood to be the issue of interest. We basically just took his model and applied it here. All of this could easily be improved with even probably basic more knowledge of machine learning than what we've got. Um, so this is the distribution of samples that you see in recount. So you can see, for example, that there's a ton of blood um, samples and a ton of brain samples and a ton of skin samples. So not surprised about blood and uh, skin, but it's kind of surprising how many brain samples there are in, in uh, uh, SRA, right? Blood and skin are easy to get. Brain is relatively challenging. Um, so this is the confusion matrix for that prediction. And you can see, so this is colon, for example, and you can see that for the most part we predict colon when you have it labeled as colon, which makes sense. 
Um, sometimes a sample is predicted as intestine when it's actually colon. Um, or sorry, the other way around, it's, a report, it's reported as intestine, we predict it as colon. We kind of think that's okay. Um, then there's some cases like where adipose tissue is for the most part labeled as adipose tissue. Sometimes it's labeled as breast tissue. So again, that's relatively okay. Then, but if you look at like, for example, when we predict vagina, sometimes we're predicting cervical, which is kind of okay, and vagina, which is kind of okay, but sometimes a significant fraction of the time we predict lung. And we, we have yet to figure out why that's happening. And there's a few examples like this in here where we like predict wildly tissues that we can't figure out from either a developmental or a functional perspective why we're predicting the wrong tissue, but we consistently do. So that's kind of a weird problem. Maybe somebody has in machine learning has an idea about that. So <laughs> sometimes we don't know what's going on. So um, I mean, could it, maybe someone in biology could uh, solve that. I mean, what, what we have asked our friends. We have we do have biologist friends. <laughs> 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 our biologist <laughs> friends did that when we asked. You know, and there was not. Uh, there was like that's what I'm saying. Is like if you could imagine different yeah, perspectives, right? right? Yeah. So there is there is. I mean, there's various theories that have been postulated, none of which we've been able to convincingly look at the data and be like, oh yeah, that's definitely what's going on. So if, if it's denser, you can look at the data, like more frequent than size, you know, as, yeah. as a way to look, but those are healthy samples. These are all ostensibly healthy samples. Now, that's the other thing. These are SRA samples, right? So they could be mislabeled, right? So, but that was predicting, that's what we predict as, I gotta make sure I get the direction right. So we predict as vagina, this is, but it's actually lung, and there's multiple studies where we do this wrong. As in, it's not just like one study is messed up and they label the tissue wrong. It's like across three different studies, we're making this weird mistake. So we can't figure it. Yeah. Is it related to your training sample size? Could it absolutely be that. Um, and I actually, that's a good question, because I haven't actually looked at the training sample size for that tissue in GTEx. Does anybody know that off the top of their head? Compared to the other ones? I don't know. I can tell you in some ways that's totally a confounding factor when you have a very small sample size, you tend to make crazy mistakes. So that, that's a good suggestion. I don't know. We haven't, we haven't considered that. And it would be great if someone, like a, a biological friend, uh, biology friend uh, we can build some kind of distance between tissues. So you can say, you know, you say, oh, intestine and colon, that's okay. Makes so sense. there's different ways you can define that distance, right? Like there's previous clusterings of tissues from previous gene expression data, so functional, but there's also developmental, like what, which developmental uh, route that the tissue went. So we kind of started looking at it, but that's a, somebody wants to write that paper. It's low hanging fruit. All right. Um, so hopefully we're here, we can get processed and summarize RNA-seq data from recount two, and we moved it a little farther by doing this sample prediction. So what about using these data and predictions? So if we go back to the original question I asked, what makes primary cancer different than metastatic cancer? Um, we can look at an old data set where they looked at this. So this is a 19-gene-based risk classification score for colorectal cancer patients. So they collected data on liver metastasis, so on healthy colon, primary, so that's NC, uh, normal colon, primary cancer, PC, and liver metastasis, MC, of those, presumably of those cancers. Um, and they were looking for differences between each of these comparisons. So they did a, a normal versus primary comparison, and they did a primary um, versus metastatic comparison to try to identify genes that are differentially expressed, okay? So this is their results. They found this many genes differentially expressed between the um, metastatic and the primary, and between the normal and the primary, and what you'd expect a lot between the normal and the primary. Um, we redid that analysis and to try to match it exactly and got different results. Surprise, surprise, that's what always happens, but we got relatively similar results. There are a bunch of genes that are different. Um, so what about if we adjust for sex in the analysis? Well, it doesn't have really any effect at all, which is, uh, uh, in this case, the sex is balanced with the other tissues, so that's kind of not totally uh, unsurprising. Um, so you can look at this in a different way, which is concordance at the top plot. And I need to tell you about these if you don't know about them already so that we can uh, explain some of the results on the next couple of slides. So what you do is you do two different analyses and you get two ranked sets of genes. And you want to know, are those genes the same or not? And there's going to be variation because there's biological variation, technological variation. So what you do is you rank all the genes from analysis one, and then you count what fraction of the genes from analysis one 
um, that are ranked below rank I also are ranked below rank I for analysis one. So if they have the same gene in common, you count it. It counts as a one, otherwise it counts as a zero. And so, oops. So then you go count how many of the ten most differential, ten top genes in analysis A are also among the ten top genes in analysis B, right? So if the lists are the same, you should get a line, right? And if the lists are different, you get something that peels off the line. So this is like perfect concordance. This is they're really concordant at the top, and then they start to be less concordant over time. This is like fake data. This is just to show you how these things work. And this is like they're really different. Okay, so we did this analysis. Um, with sex, then the next thing that we considered is so this and with sex, the two analyses are like really concordant between our analysis and their analysis. Um, then the next analysis we did was we used our predicted tissue as a covariate in the model. And so when you use our predicted tissue, you see that all the genes go away, they're no longer differentially expressed between the metastatic cancer and the primary cancer, or between the normal colon and the primary cancer. Well, actually, it doesn't really, this is an NA because we, if you adjust for tissue, there's like, it doesn't really matter, right? Because you have the, it's the same tissue. Um, here, what you see is the concordance between our genes with no covariates and our genes with the covariates. And so what it's showing is that the MCPC comparison is totally different if you adjust for tissue or if you don't adjust for tissue. So what does that mean? So this suggests that the differential expression between the primary and the metastatic is not actually between primary and metastatic, it's actually between liver and colon. And the, 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 the metastatic sample was actually largely just the tissue, a poorly uh, resected component that had mostly liver tissue in it, so you're seeing differential expression. So to validate that, what we would want to see is that the differential expression between the primary and the metastatic looked like differential expression between normal liver and normal colon, right? If those were concordant, then you would imagine that's what that our hypothesis is somewhat validated. Um, so we have expression data actually from normal colon and normal liver and GTEx, so we can just go do the analysis using data from those studies. So our hypothesis is that the MCPC results should be most similar to GTEx colon versus liver. And so it does turn out to be true. So there's hardly any concordance at all between the normal liver, normal colon analysis, and the normal primary analysis in GTEx, uh, or sorry, and the normal primary analysis. The, uh, MCPC analysis, which is the one where we're comparing metastasis to primary, we see concords much more nicely with a, just a differential expression analysis between liver and colon. So what this suggests is that the signature that they found suggesting this was a signature of metastasis was actually a signature of tissue differences. So this suggests you can go back and re-answer biological questions once you've added the phenotype, the new phenotype labels on top of these data. So hopefully this means we can do some faster studies using these data. This is sort of the goal of this project. So if you want to use any of this stuff, we have versions of the predictions that you can use. They get better over time. So you have to know which version you're using. I think we're on version eight now. These are old slides. Um, uh, you can get them by using, if you load the recount package, you can then download a study. You can scale the counts to normalize them instead of that normalization we talked about. Then you can add the predicted phenotypes, and then you'll have a nice, clean, organized metadata predicted phenotype data set, and you're off the races to go. This is in a preprint, and also just got, this has been just recently published in Clay Cass's research. Um, and so, let's see, Pheno Predict is an R package, Recount, you can Google, Recount Suite, you can Google. This is for alignment if you want to do that, and don't contact Shannon. You can, she's very nice. But you can also contact me. You can see I borrowed this slide from her directly. So thanking very much Shannon, who did the bulk of this you know, predictive work, and then Sarah, who did a significant fraction of the um, uh, you know, like the, the fixing up the phenotype prediction later on, and then Jack did the transcript abundances for recount, and a big group of these folks are responsible for actually generating all the recount summary measures. With that, I will thank you for your time.